<clears throat> hey, what's up, everybody? Drew here from The Anxious Truth. I am joined today by a special guest, my friend Krista Homan. Homan? Homan. Um, Homans. Krista Homans, that's right. I'm sorry. Krista, <laughs> I found on Instagram at where she is more popularly known as the Neurodivergent Rebel, which is like one of the greatest Instagram handles ever. <laughs> and uh, Thanks. Krista is not only living the life of, of somebody on that autism spectrum, and you can correct me if I use wrong terminology, I would be okay with that because I'd like you to educate us a little bit. Um, and you've been at this since 2016. Why don't you give us a, a, an, an idea of what you guys got going on? At yeah. Neuro so I was diagnosed autistic. Um, I was 29, so I went almost 30 years of my life having no idea I was autistic. Um, but that being said, you know, you always know something is different uh, because you kind of go about your life being scolded for being a contrarian, despite that never being your intent. People, you know, people, you know, pe when you're missed, people don't know you're, you know, thinking in a different way, and so they just assume you're being difficult all the time. Right. Uh, and when I was, when I finally found out, it was kind of like somebody gave me this like rule book for my life, like an instruction manual. It's like this aha moment that really, it, it set me on a new path. Uh, um, it really helped me start taking care of myself in a more autistic, friendly way because I had just been pushing myself and running myself into the ground trying to keep up with non-autistic standards mm -hmm. uh, because I just thought I was a failed non-autistic person, you know, because I couldn't do things that were easy for other people, despite, you know, at the same time being able to do some really complex things that people struggle with easily, you know, it's like, a, it's two-sided coin, but it's like you really fixate on, like, what the little things that you, you suck at, unfortunately, because, you know, unfortunately, you know, with anxiety, I'm sure you talk about here on this podcast, like, yeah. those, those mistakes are under a magnifying glass and you see them and like they kind of you ruminate on those sometimes and so it you I kind of got myself into a, a frustrated spot um before I was diagnosed so that diagnosis kind of you know, course corrected me in a, a much more uh positive and constructive direction that I needed to get myself on track yeah and which has led to this mission that you've got going on online and I was saying before we started recording that you actually introduced me to the term neurodivergence which I had never heard before I will I will plead ignorance on that and explain just for a second before we get into the conversation what is neurodivergence like what is the concept there because I think it's amazing and spectacular so yeah so Basically, you know, the concept of neurodiversity and neurodivergence, it's, you know, like human diversity, there's, there's, and biodiversity in nature, there's diversity, it's, it's advantageous to have diversity. And so neurodiversity says there are different thinking styles that are just natural variations in the human, you know, brain, you know, people with ADHD, or uh, dyslexia, autistic people, myself, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, others, you know, and there are sometimes Tourette's, uh, it really depends on, um, you know, what it can, ah, brain words, <laughs> autistic uh, moment here. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just completely like had so a, good. A, a train wreck there. Um, but basically, it just says that all of these brain types um, are here and we should respect them and nurture them and help each of them to be the best you know, versions of themselves and best persons, they, people they can be, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a great, great message. I like the idea that it's not necessarily, this is not a problem that we're necessarily trying to fix. It's just natural variation. And like everybody brings a little something different to the table. So, you know, you even mentioned before, like some things you're really good at that maybe other people aren't. So like, let's not miss that. So very mm -hmm. cool. So uh, before we get into it, I, I was telling Krista before we started recording that this all started when somebody in, in my Facebook group asked if the methods that we talk about in the podcast to deal with anxiety and anxiety disorders, that whole facing, floating, accepting thing, going toward the fear, not reacting, all of those things, and, and unlearning the cognitive link between panic and danger, you know, would those be helpful to an autistic person who's struggling? And I thought, I, I don't know how to answer that question, but I, I kind of thought you might have something to say about it. And that's how we got into this, like, hey, let's do a, a podcast together. So... I would imagine that you, you were saying that, you know, anxiety does come along with people that are on the autism spectrum. I mean, is it automatic for everybody or is it, I mean, you're no different than you, than anyone else. Like you may have anxious days and not anxious days. Some things may cause anxiety, same may not, I'm sure. 
it's not I'm guessing it's not automatic. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think we, well, we know a large number of autistic people report having issues with anxiety. But, you know, the question is, is it is it natural for autistic people to have anxiety or is that um, just a side effect of the unintentional gaslighting that a lot of us face in life? Because, you know, especially, you know, those of us who are undiagnosed, you know, your whole life you're told you're just not trying hard enough, you're, you know, you're, you're lazy, all these things when you're really, you're trying your hardest and everyone around you is telling you you're just not trying hard enough. Uh, it just kind of breaks you down. Or, you know, if you have sensory processing differences and other people around you don't, so mm -hmm. you walk into the grocery store and the lights, like, literally burn your eyes like needles and it hurts to walk into a Walmart and you want to wear sunglasses inside and, you, you, and people are like, no, you can't do that or you're just being ridiculous or why, you don't need that. And you just think, oh, okay, everyone else must be in pain too and I guess they can tough it out and I'm just a wimp, you know? You don't know um, and then, you know, sometimes people just don't understand that you're coming from a different perspective. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of misunderstandings and that kind of breeds anxiety. So I don't know, you know, if autistic people naturally have anxiety. I know I've had anxiety throughout my life for, I think, about as long as I can maybe remember. Um, but I don't think there's a one size fits all answer for that or, yeah. you know, for solutions, just like with you know, non-autistic people. <laughs> right. That's what I think. Like, I, I can't imagine that there'd be, you know, there's that much difference, to be honest with you. Like, there's going to be variation in every segment of the population, you know, including yours and mine. So what's, you know, I, I would imagine that makes sort of, sort of sense. But uh, so I think one of the things that you, you just mentioned that was super interesting is that thing where maybe you walk into a Walmart and the lights are so bright that for somebody who deals with that, that sort of sensory overstimulation problem it can be a real, real issue. Now, that's also, a, for people who suffer from anxiety disorders, that's also an anxiety symptom. But mm. I have to start to wonder because I've heard people come through, like the, my community surrounding the podcast, who have talked about that issue. Like, it feels like my brain is literally going to explode. I must run home and go into the dark. And it's super easy for everybody to say, oh, that's just an anxiety symptom. It's fine. Just accept it. Keep going. But once in a while, you'll you'll hit that person that, that doesn't appear to be the answer. Like, no, you don't understand. Like, I literally feel like my my brain is on fire, which mm -hmm. is tough for, for us to hear sometimes because feel I, I always say feels like is the biggest lie going. You can't live based on what it feels like because anxiety will lie to you. You know, it feels like you're dying when you're really not. But there are plenty of people mm -hmm. who have indicated that like, no, this feels like a real physical overwhelming thing. And I have to wonder that if the experience of, somebody who is autistic with a, with a panic attack must be different to a certain extent. And I wonder, is the approach slightly different? So you dealt with anxiety. I don't know if you've actually dealt with an anxiety disorder, like panic disorder or agoraphobia, but how have you found a way to cope? What have you done in your life? See, this, this is great because what you were just talking about, I've had panic attacks and then a little bit more on like the overwhelm of the lights and mm -hmm. other things. Um, sensory overload is something that is not only an autistic thing and basically you know in sensory overload it, it is very similar to a panic attack in a lot of ways um, but it's not anxiety triggered although you mm -hmm. can have anxiety about sensory overload because you know it's terrible and you know it happens anytime you're going to go into certain situations right. uh, but like sensory overload really is like the brain is just overloaded and it just can't process any more information and so your brain does kind of start to shut down uh, and so what you have in sensory overload is you know, you, you kind of lose a bit of cognition first and maybe you get a little slurry or if you you might notice things are weird. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of you, you start to kind of go downhill from there. And then if you don't get yourself out of the place, you know, you might have a, almost an anxious reaction where it's like, get out of here because your brain is like sending signals, run, run, get away. This is bad. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, because then you really can just have overloaded your brain and you can't have it handle anymore. And so that's like sensory overload. And, you know, like I said, it's not a specific autistic thing, but it is something that's more common with autistic people and happens more frequently with autistic people. Mm -hmm. And then panic attacks. Oh, they suck. I hate panic attacks. I think we can all agree on that. 
I don't know anybody who loves them. <laughs> oh, they, they suck so bad. And I've had and I've had both of those things. And they do feel a little bit similar, but the panic attack is f- so frustrating because well, for many reasons. I think you know all the reasons it's frustrating. Um, but it's, you know, definitely dif- definitely different triggers. Although I think I've had panic attacks thinking about having sensory overload, you know, yeah. too much because they're not fun. Um, and I I when I got diagnosed autistic I also got a social anxiety diagnosis although hindsight I was kind of holding back a lot of things because there's a stigma Mm. about anxiety Mm -hmm. mental health and I also didn't have the language to talk about anxiety and mental health because it was never considered or something that anyone talked about uh growing up and I you know generalized anxiety might have been more accurate uh but I, you know, I, I got the social anxiety diagnosis and I was like, no, I don't even have anxiety, even though I had all the physical symptoms, mm-hmm. you know, my, I was having indigestion, sweaty palms, like all of it, you know, physically. Yeah. But I was like, I was so used to operating at that level of high anxiety all the time. That was that your normal. Normal. Yeah. I had yeah. just put it all, and I've just stepped on it and used it all to climb up and I was just used to it. You know, and I, I would, I was burning myself out. I was making myself sick, and that's yeah. why, you know, I ended up being diagnosed because yeah. I had health problems related to the anxiety, and so I was, you know, a sick autistic, and so I was, you know, bad enough off mentally to where I represented what people think a stereoty- stereotypical autistic looks like because you know mental health professionals they don't know what an autistic and good mental health looks like the, the the definition of an autistic person in the dsm is basically an autistic in crisis or an autistic person in bad mental health okay so, so what, what does it look like in a regular good day does anybody describe that <clears throat> yeah i mean we're i'm like a normal human i'm a normal person you right, know? why wouldn't you I'm, be? I'm a bit you know, and we're not all introverts either, but I'm a bit introverted. I'm a bit of a recluse. I need a lot of recharge time. Mm-hmm. You know, I need a lot of downtime because when I go out in sensory environments like stores and, you know, when I used to work in offices more, like it would really physically drain me down. And, you know, now my employer lets me work remotely and I can work a lot more hours remotely than I can when I have to physically go to an office and commute. And driving is one of the things that's easy for a lot of people that is really difficult for me. And right. I've put a lot of hours and miles on the road practicing it. I think it's always just going to be harder. Um, and so not having to do that even just is such an amazing accommodation. Um, but you know, a lot of people are hesitant to give those things because they're like, well, everybody wants that. <laughs> yeah, like, but, uh, what I find nice fascinating about employer. that is, right. I, I think, you know, okay. So in your particular instance, there was a diagnosis of a, a diagnosis of autism and maybe there was some difficulties that went along with that. But, there's probably a zillion people out there that would do much better if they didn't have to get in a car and drive for an hour and a half every day and mm-hmm. to get to a job. So, yeah, that's that. I don't know if that's necessarily a thing that where you'd single yourself out because of the diagnosis. Like, I think a lot of people would benefit from that in the end. But I, I like how you said that driving. I don't like that driving is a problem for you. But I mean, I like mm-hmm. how you said that driving is a problem. But you you have spent a lot of time practicing it. So. Like this is a key theme that runs through my podcast and through the community around the podcast, never running away from the things that you fear. And I like that this has been a problem for you, but you do not appear to be backing away from it. I mean, it may be your particular circumstance means it will always be difficult for you, but it doesn't sound like you've shied away from it, though. You, you'll still do it. Yeah, no. And, you know, there was a point in my life. Gosh, OK. I don't know when the switch happened because I wasn't always so willing to test my boundaries and push my fears. I Hmm. wasn't, you know, I know when I was, you know, my best friend who I've known since, ooh, preschool, you know, younger, uh, because she was next door neighbor growing up and we were the same age. Um, when I, you know, some people I've told them about my diagnosis and they don't really know what to make of it because I don't fit their definition of what they think autism is, or they know, they, they feel they've known me or they know me really well. And to them, this would change who I am in their eyes. And so they can't accept it. So Mm -hmm. people have a hard time accepting the information for a lot of different reasons I'm, I'm learning, but she 
was in like elementary school with me and Girl Scouts with me and saw me with other people our age. And she's like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense, which is so funny, right? In but hindsight. In yeah. hindsight, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, oh my gosh, where was I going with this? Steer well, me. yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it, it was that thing where like you weren't always so willing to face your Oh, feet. yes. Okay. Yeah. And so she 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 was saying she remembers like once upon a time when I was a kid, I was like, you know, this little person who like I couldn't do anything because and that was because I was holding myself back. I was like afraid of everything. You know, I had so much anxiety about everything and perfectionism Mm -hmm. really bad, like being just afraid to just kind of pull it and let it go, you know, and it's good enough and let it go. Just you can never accept when it's good enough. Um, And, you know, at some point. I think I learned that if I I wanted to learn something, I could learn it as long as I practiced, like, really, really hard. And it took a lot of work, and I could eventually get there, you know. And I learned, oh, wow, okay, through my stubbornness, I can do really amazing things. And that was a confidence booster. And then so I started being willing to try more and more risky things, even mm-hmm. things that are really scary to me, like, one of the things I made myself do a few years ago at a team building at one of my last employers was like jump off of a like a platform, like two story platform into a stunt bag, which I will never do again. I because one of my <laughs> well, biggest did it, fears though. is like falling. Yeah, yeah, but you and did I it. I did it, but in my head the entire time, like there was graphic images of how I was gonna die because I did it wrong, and it was so terrible. But I was like, no, we're doing this anyway. But it was, and it was, no, it was not fun, but I'm glad I did it, you know, because yeah. I had to do it. But, oh, my gosh. And I had never felt my, my body was, like, so frozen and stiff. I couldn't even feel my body afterwards. It was like, oh. Yeah. But, you know, it. I want to, like, I learned a lot of the fear and the anxiety is not logical. Oh, it's not logical in any way. There's and nothing so- logical about it. And so when I see something's not logical or I'm like, okay, I'm not going to get hurt. This actually isn't going to hurt me. Or what's the worst that can happen? I just have to just jump. And it's like, that's why I just tell myself in my head, this little pep talk. Okay, just jump, just jump. And I hit, I say that even like little things like, you know, like it's about to send an email to a client that I've read a million times. And I'm like, okay, is this good enough to send to this client? Is there a typo? Did I spell it? You know, and I've looked at it, but it's like, okay, I just have to jump. I just have to hit send. You know, and just I just have to go, and because otherwise I can be paralyzed by my own anxiety, and it won't let me move. And right. I just I just had to start pushing through it. That's that's amazing because that I mean, obviously that's you're on a slightly different journey, possibly for different reasons. But you have described exactly what so many people who listen to me are trying to do. Now maybe <laughs> they're trying to get to the point where they can get back out the door or drive on the highway again because they're. You know, they've been, their world is shrinking because of panic and agoraphobia and things of that nature. But it's always that thing where, well, I know logically that I shouldn't be afraid to go into the supermarket, yet I am and I can't do it. And the only way we talk about all the time, the only way to actually be able to go into the supermarket is to go into the supermarket. You'll never Mm -hmm. be able to talk your way out of the fear. You must show yourself that you are okay. And so you're describing such a very similar, a very similar process. Like just got to jump. And at some point, yeah. people who are dealing with these problems also have to just take that leap of faith that like, oh, I'm going to be OK, even though I think I'm in their case, they're panicked to the point where they think they may die or go insane and that sort of stuff. But you still have to take a leap of faith and know that that stunt bag is there to catch you and and you're OK. And you learn through experience that it's OK. So your willingness to go and do those hard things and scary things mirrors the experience of a person who is recovering from an anxiety disorder. It's really amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was great. That that was really, really, really helpful. So sure. I think um, I, we don't want to go too long. We're going to try and keep it under 30 minutes. So we got about 10 okay. more minutes to go. Um, <clears throat> so the things that you have learned to do to adapt in terms of you didn't even know you had anxiety, which is amazing to me. You just thought that was your normal. Like I'm, my palms are supposed to sweat. I'm supposed my heart is supposed to pound out of my chest. That's just normal. Right. So is so did it not take a lot of adaptation or or work to overcome the anxiety issues? Or once you had a label for it, it became easier or they, they're still there. I mean, it, how did you wind up working yeah. through all that? So I started working through it before I knew what it was and before it had a name, I think. Okay. Because I knew 
something was wrong. You know, not really the autism, but the anxiety. Something was wrong. Right. And so I had been seeking out lots of things, and I would bury myself in exercise. And then I got really, really into yoga, and that was amazing. You know, not just the physical part, because there's a very spiritual and lots of breathing and mindfulness with yoga, and that was so good to me. And then it led me to Buddhism. And so, mm. as an autistic person, you know, for me, and we're all different, but in a very stereotypical way, like lists and handful checklists of things like are yeah. so useful to me. And this, like Buddhism was like this very practical system of like getting your brain right and kind of calming your wild mind that's all over the place. Right. Uh, and so I started, you know, with a lot more mindfulness and Buddhism and meditation. And for me, that was really helpful. But the breathing exercises the most and, mm -hmm. you know, being more aware of, oh, here's that feeling again. And it, you know, observing what does this feeling feel like? I know it's going to pass. All of that stuff, just being with it. But I learned that, you know, before I had a name for what I was even dealing with. Like, mm -hmm. I started to do those things because I was like, I, I knew it gave me relief. And I hadn't had relief my entire life. You know, yeah. I'd always been, or at least for as long as I could remember, I'd been just amped up, anxious. I'm a million miles an hour kind of a person anyway. Um <laughs> So that was really helpful. And then when I was diagnosed autistic and then, you know, I started to, you know, learn more about anxiety because a lot of autistic people have anxiety for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to be more involved in kind of autism and then mental health community. And I learned more about anxiety and I was like, okay, you know, I probably I have a lot of anxiety. I started to realize and I started to really deal with it, like really deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is, you know, giving it a name helped so much. Um, yeah, go ahead. It sounds like you've developed a lot of the same tools that we talk about all the time on the podcast. And people that are in this process of overcoming these anxiety disorders, so the difference between anxiety and anxiety disorder, use all the same tools. The meditation, the mindfulness, the breathing exercises. Not because they're shields against panic and anxiety, but they're focusing tools, they're mind calming mm -hmm. tools, they're quieting tools. You know, it puts you back in the driver's seat a little bit. So... It sounds like you had a similar experience with those particular tools that, mm -hmm. that, that they've helped you out, which is great. Um, and I, so I think uh, I want to get to a couple of the questions that people had asked that maybe you can shed some light on. There, there wasn't a whole lot, but um, one person had – well, I'm going to ask a question first. My question first. Yeah. I, it's my podcast, so I get to ask first. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the question would be – and I've had people – many people that follow me and listen to the podcast, they're dealing with their children are – are having anxiety problems and that they're looking for help with their children, which is great, or other family members. And some of which are also diagnosed autistic or they have other neurodivergence issues, if you will. And mm -hmm. I know like they worry sometimes I've got that. Like, well, well, how does this complicate it for my son or my daughter? You know, and I don't know, I, I'm guessing there's no blanket answer to that because, because of diversity within every community, of course. But do you have a, an opinion on that? Is there a wrinkle here? Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh it's hard when you're helping, especially if you're helping, you know, your, your kids and they're younger, um, with autistic kids, it, you know, it's with anxiety, it, it can even be OCD level sometimes, mm -hmm. or, um, we tend to be like, I, at least I am, I, I'm really fixated on problems and I see a problem and it's big and it's glaring me in the face, okay. you know? Uh, and it's like, I can't ignore it until I, I've checked it off that it's taken care of and it's good and it's safe, okay? And as a kid, you know, I would tell my mom things like, oh, I can't get out of the bathtub, I'll slip and I'll crack my head open and I'll, I'll bleed to death and I'll die. And my mom thinks I'm being dramatic because I'm this logical kid. Why would I really think that would happen? Like, I, I was like, for way longer than it should be, yeah. my mom had to pick me up and take me out of the bathtub. But I was really, like, convinced, like, I'm also a very visual thinker, so, like, mm -hmm. thoughts in my head are, you know, I close my eyes, and it's like a, a VR 360 movie. I can see it clearly. And so I could see very clearly what I had imagined in my head happening, and it was real to me, and I was yeah. convinced that that was going to happen to me. And my, you know, but people from the outside don't understand, like, that it, how real that is. Right, um, right. Which may be and, more of a wrinkle because of your position uh, on that spectrum, possibly. Is that what you're intimating? I'm not sure. Yeah, and, and it's tricky because, you know, autistic people, 
a lot of like we we think and we experience the world and our emotions often in a more intense way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, situations for us that aren't as overwhelming for others can be more overwhelming for us. And, um, you know, we we tend to ruminate on things, you know, our our obsessive nature, you know, is good and it's a gift and it's a curse. Right. You know, like I have, you know, I said I can I can get really good at anything I want to learn. You know, for the most part. Right. You know, I failed miserably when I was trying really hard to be non-autistic and keep up with my peers in the workplace that weren't. I couldn't wow. do it. Yeah. And that hurt my self-esteem because I I hadn't ever tried to do something and failed since I had like realized, oh, I can do anything I put my mind to if I try hard enough, you know, and then I failed. But I, and then, you know, I got the diagnosis. I was like, oh, it's okay. You know, I wasn't meant to. Yeah. Um, but it's just trying to keep moving forward, but it's hard um, when we get, you know, that obsessiveness can be a good, when can be such a bad thing at the same time. Yeah. And so it sounds like it may actually, and for people who are, are, you know, not on the spectrum, just, you know, with dealing with these disorders, those thoughts and obsessions and fears do feel so real and so powerful. And it sounds like maybe it's even amped up a bit more for you or someone in your position. So I think that's an understanding that the rest of us should probably keep in our pockets. Like as hard as it is for you, it may even be more difficult for, for a person in that position to, to really make that leap of faith into the fear because the fear feels even more intense as it does for somebody else. The thought mm -hmm. is deeper ingrained. It repeats more all those things. Well, it sounds yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, just think about that. You know, if our memories are already like 360 VR experiences, think mm. about like PTSD and PTSD flashbacks. That's what people get with PTSD, right? right. It's kind of right. almost like a flashback situation. Right. And so, you know, autistic people who, are really keened into their senses and mm -hmm. really like hooked on senses like can be triggered to really haunting traumatic memories from sense and touch and yeah. a song and you know we're suddenly like back you know i have memories of being one and a half year old just as clear as wow. yesterday yeah you know, but my short term memory is really tricky and annoying and I have like to write so many notes down because I, I can't take written instructions. I won't remember what you need me to do. It's yeah. frustrating how that works. Uh, but it's like I can remember so many things like it was just yesterday. So it's not like time really makes the memories go away. There's like not a really normal time space continuum in my head. It's all like it was just yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting. So I think it would probably be a more patient approach. It would more patience and maybe a bit more time and a bit more of a, I'm not going to say a gentle approach, because if anything I know of you, it's never a victim. There's never a victim mentality in your world. I could see, which is awesome. <laughs> but, you know, I think a reality check is always, always a good thing. So one question that came up that a lot of people seem to like was when on the spectrum, how can you prevent the natural overstimulation that you may experience from yeah. becoming anxiety? So and we maybe maybe talked about that a little bit in the beginning. We were talking about that sensory overload thing, but a lot of people seem to love that question. So, if you're naturally stimulated more than than I might be, for instance, how do you keep that from becoming, you know, a, a heightened state of anxiety or even panic? For the people who yeah. are listening to me, they're they're likely thinking, how do I keep this from turning into yet another panic attack? Mm -hmm. Or do you? You know. Well, I think you know. First, you have to kind of learn to recognize, you know, maybe keep notes and figure out what your triggers are. What mm -hmm. is triggering these episodes? Mm -hmm. You know, is it this store? Is it every time I go to these kinds of stores? What stores is it? You can narrow down. Is it a lighting thing? Is it a sound thing? Is it, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, all for all of the senses with autistic people or people with sensory processing differences or SPD, mm -hmm. um, any of the senses, you know, like a, a radio dial or a volume knob can be dialed up or down if we say middle is normal, mm -hmm. normal whatever right. normal is. <laughs> um, and so it can be more intense or less intense depending on which way you dial it. And that's for taste and sound and smell. Um, and so... You know, if you're just overwhelmed with any of these senses, eventually your brain is just like, uh. So you want to start to learn to recognize, like, at the first sign of something's wrong, I'm starting to feel like I'm not myself or, mm -hmm. you know, that, okay, I, I to maybe remove myself or go engage in something that 
is the opposite of overstimulating the brain. Something that's relaxing. You know, go color a coloring book. Go right. play with some silly putty. Go, you know, go sniff some essential oils. Go do something that is soothing. Go lay under the, on a couch with a weighted blanket. Oh my god, I love my weighted blanket. <laughs> the best you know just go you know go cuddle a puppy yeah you know go but when you but you need to learn like oh this is i'm getting overloaded and i need to rest and then for me as an autistic person i've had to learn that i'm really all or nothing i have no off switch like i i will go until i finish something if i don't block in self-care and rest time so i make a point to like schedule my downtime because i really need downtime you know say if i know i'm gonna be traveling and i've got a bunch of trips like mm -hmm. like in october i went to you know a few different cities and i had to i was on like so many different airplanes that month and it's like okay so i had to like block in this is a rest day i am not doing anything that day and it's like i'm not allowed to work this day i have i'm going to maybe watch some netflix yeah and, and you know, cuddle with the puppies and eat some popsicles and hang out at home and not not work. You know, just downtime. Yeah. Um, because it's like the brain is overstimulated, so that you have to like constantly be aware of that and be thinking about okay, what what is good for me that is the opposite of overstimulation that can kind of balance that out. Yeah. Um, and so learning yourself that takes a lot. That's probably the the biggest task is learning yourself and learning your triggers. So interesting because some of what you described, which makes perfect sense, and obviously you figured a lot of these things out through trial and error for yourself, probably, mm -hmm. are the they would be cardinal sins in 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 my world. Like, so you go into the the supermarket and you're feeling overwhelmed, and you are correct, like in your situation, but you are actually perceiving it that way. Your perception of that environment is different than mine, and so you must act on the fact that it is a different perception. Whereas we would normally tell somebody, nope, you just have to relax into that and, and stay. And when you run, you learn that the supermarket is dangerous, but that's not what you're doing. Like you are literally adapting to the reality. It is a reality for you. It's not, it's not in your head. It's not, it's not a false fear. That is the reality of how you perceive the world. So but we've been told it's in our heads a lot. That must that have been incredibly sensitive. frustrating. It must have yes. been. Yes. And so I think if, you know, if there's one person listening to us that maybe hasn't been diagnosed or doesn't know, isn't sure there was some question, I know that there are people that probably are trying to do this thing that I talk about doing where like, no, you don't leave the situation because that's, that's the wrong thing to do, who maybe really should leave the situation if they are truly perceiving it that way. Um, mm -hmm. it's such a fascinating thing. So it adds a bit of a fine line to walk. You need to get out of the situation and then learn the proper way, I guess, to be able to do that task as opposed to just never doing the task again. And, and here's some other, you know, maybe tips too, to, you know, if, if you find out that it's like overstimulation from light or overstimulation from sound, then yeah. okay. Um, get some, what is it? The, right, the, the silent headphones? Yep, yep. Or and, even there are the sonic earplugs you can use mm -hmm. at a concert. You know, that's Or sunglasses and yeah, wear absolutely. those inside. And then sure. see if you feel less anxious. See if you feel better. Right. Uh, and be and that's the hard thing. It's like people like worry of if they, they look funny going into stores with these things on. Yeah. But if it makes you feel better and you know I started doing these things and I was like, oh my gosh, just having sunglasses on going into Lowe's and Walmart, I'm like, I don't hate being in here anymore. Wow. We can run around and goof off in Walmart. And that's a that's a big deal what you just said because I think that's a good litmus test. So somebody who's saying like, I don't know, I just feel like I can't do it. If you put on those sunglasses and suddenly Walmart becomes much, much easier, then that's probably a really good chance that says that, yes, you are truly experiencing that visual overstimulation. Mm -hmm. Somebody in the throes of an anxiety disorder who is not on the spectrum puts on the sunglasses and it doesn't matter. Something else will, will make them fearful. So the sunglasses will not help. Mm -hmm. So it's such an interesting thing to think about. Like it adds a wrinkle, you know, you still have to learn to take care of yourself and go shopping and do those errands and everything, but you have to be aware of how you're perceiving the world, I guess, what the triggers are and then how to adapt to those things. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. It's tremendously helpful. Tremendously helpful. Oh, glad. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess we'll kind of wrap it up. There was one other question that somebody asked, but you kind of brought it up again. Uh, this person says, I was diagnosed with ADD late in the game, and after years of anxiety disorder, she was conflicted, like chicken and egg issue. Did I, do I have ADD, or do I have an anxiety disorder? Do I have both? 
which came before the other. But I don't know. Does it really even matter in the end? I, you know, I did have some symptoms early in childhood. I didn't have true poor memory and agitation until she became agoraphobic. So it all became a kind of a jumbled mess for this person where, wait, do I have ADD and an anxiety disorder? Do I have one or the other? And it became hard for her, I guess, to, to keep them separate or pry them apart. I don't know if you have found that in your situation or, or dealt with people where it all gets mixed up. Oh, great. Another diagnosis. Yeah. Well, you know, and what's interesting is with neurodiversity, a lot of the uh, conditions are co commonly co-occurring co with one another. Like yeah. autism. I don't have ADHD. One of my best closest friends is ADHD. And I have a lot of ADHD friends, like just naturally, I don't know, yeah. I gravitate to towards the ADHD years, <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, you know, it's not, we're, we're <laughs> neurodivergent. People. We can feel it. Yeah. White people. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the, with autism or ADHD, it is something that it's a lifelong diagnosis. You don't um, age out of it; you age into it. Kind of, mm. you grow into it, you mature into it, and you know you learn to cope, um, or you don't, uh, and you kind of you you change as you grow. But you know the way you think um, doesn't really ever change, and it's hard to say too. But because with autism um, and then with ADHD. Uh, you know, there's always, you know, the possibility of misdiagnosis or, or whatever, but, you know, with ADHD, I think anxiety is kind of a common co co-occurring thing too, if I'm not mistaken, because I know mm -hmm. my ADHD friends are also anxiety people. Yeah. Uh, we were really similar. And what's really interesting is a lot of, in a lot of ways, I almost feel sometimes like it's hard to tell autistic kids and ADHD kids apart. We're so similar sometimes. I think the right. ADHD kids are a little bit more outgoing sometimes, but even autistic kids can be um, really outgoing and sociable, believe it or not. Uh, yeah. Especially, you know, um, so it's like pe people just don't understand, you know. <laughs> we Like I was the one that was, I was really outgoing and really social, and I didn't realize when the other kids were picking on me. I thought, you know, because I, I just thought, oh, they'd be nice, you know, they'd be my friends. I, I, you know, I wouldn't get it when yeah. they were being manipulative little monsters. Like it would just be totally over my head. Right. Um, Interesting. So I think it's in the end, it all starts to tie together, right? Everybody exhibits traits of everyone else's issue the, uh, the little autism adhd kind of fit together people who have anxiety disorders exhibit some of those traits although they're under distress at the moment but mm -hmm. would be easily you know uh, kind of confused for somebody who has adhd so in the end my answer to that sometimes is what does the diagnosis matter now in your case the diagnosis did matter because it answered a ton of questions mm -hmm. but people struggle sometimes with like well I don't, I don't know what I am. So this diagnosis is, is either a death sentence for me or not a death sentence, but now I'm locked into this. This is what I am. And I, I think they worry about that. So that's probably would fuel that question. But in the end, you learn to adapt and, and live and build your skill set that you got to build. And what does it matter in the end? Sometimes, you know, that well, that's, that's why I like neurodiversity too, because it's, you know, it says all of these different brain types exist and are here. And, you know, sometimes it's easier for people to say, you know, I feel like I'm neurodivergent in some way. Yeah. And the, I feel like I'm neurodivergent. I mean, there's a lot of different things that within that, but it's like, yeah. I feel, you know, but you can know, like, I have a different brain type. I can tell, you know, because yeah. yeah. you know, when you've kind of gone about the world and have been scolded your whole life for being a weirdo and you were just like, I'm just normal me. What are you talking about? You know, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> certainly not a weirdo. So this has been great. We're at almost 40 minutes. So we'll wrap oh, it up wow. here. Yeah, I know. We went, we kept going. We kept drawing away. I would do this again with you in a heartbeat. So I appreciate oh, yeah. your time. You were like incredibly helpful to the people who are listening. I know. So before we go, where can people find you? Yes. So uh, neurodivergentrebel.com is probably the easiest place. Uh, I'm on all social media platforms as neurodivergent rebel. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty easy to track down. Yeah, you are. You're pretty visible. <laughs> Which I, I dig. Yeah, I dig. And you should definitely follow Kristen because the message is out. I, I just love it. Anyway, that's me. So I appreciate your time. Maybe we'll do it again one day. And um, yeah, that's it. I'll stop the recording and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you, awesome. Kristen. Thank you. All right. See you guys next time.